Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's video, Anthony Power and I are going to be joined by the Chief Mining Officer of Bitfarms Limited. This is a company that we've covered for quite some time on the channel and in today's presentation we're going to be talking about their synthetic hodl strategy, their recent ATM and growth strategy moving into 2024. Now before we get into all that, please take a second, hit the like button you guys, it's 100% free to do, it's a huge help to myself and it gets this content to other people who may find value. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join and let us know in the comment section below if you're currently holding shares of Bitfarms, what your thoughts are on their strategy compared to their mining peers and your outlook for 2024. Now with that being said, let's get into today's interview. Okay guys, so that's right, the highly anticipated interview with the Chief Mining Officer, Ben Ganong of Bitfarms. Now we've also brought along Anthony Power to help us out in this interview with some of the more accounting or um, treasury based questions. So Ben, this is your first time on the program, a very timely interview where you're just saying Bitcoin price is absolutely ripping. However, the miners have pulled back a little bit. We'll get into that in today's interview. But first and foremost, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate your time. Yes, so glad to be here, uh, Bryce. You know, I, I've been on with Anthony, you know, once or twice, but uh, first time in McNally Money and the new power mining analysis. And uh, yeah, really happy to be here. Yeah, it should be a really good discussion. So we'll get right into it here. Um, because it's your first time, Ben, maybe can you give us a little bit of background on yourself? I know you have a longstanding history in the Bitcoin mining industry and how you ended up with Bitfarms. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, most people actually you know, probably have heard my, my story before. So I'm actually going to take it one step back because um, I was having a conversation with my wife the other day and I realized my Bitcoin roots go a lot further to, to about third grade when I realized that I had low time preference. Um, you know, that was a time when I started a, a business for raking leaves and to save money. And the very first thing that I did with, with my business was I, I took my money and I invested into a century safe, like a gigantic century safe that I had to go down at the hardware store, take all my money, buy that, push it back home on my bike because it was too heavy to carry. Um, and, and I put that in my house. And the reason why I did that was because my sister was constantly stealing my money and I needed a way to protect my capital. And I needed a way to make sure that I could build my capital over the long term so that I could save for, for, for bigger things like a stereo that I really wanted. So, you know, this low time preference for me has really gone back, I think, all the way back to my, my, my early, early days. And when I got into college, um, you know, I have a, a story that I've told a few times where we had an internet forum that we used to kind of, you know, trade movies and video games and that sort of thing. And people were using Bitcoin as a currency on that website. This is back in 2010. Um, and I had a friend who was mining on his, his gaming PC in his fraternity. And, you know, he was just selling it for beer money. And we had a chance, my friend and I had a chance to buy 100 Bitcoin back then um, or $100 worth of Bitcoin back then for about 73 cents. And we we're like, oh, this is such a cool thing. You know, we, we can use it on this forum. And we're like, ah, oh, but you know, the only place that uses this is this like really CD forum that, you know, trades video files and, and games. Um, what the hell are we gonna do with this? I think this guy is screwing us to, to get money. You know, we, we'd also like beer money. So instead of buying, you know, $100 worth of Bitcoin at 73 cents in 2010, I went and bought $100 worth of beer. And, uh, you know, a year later, Bitcoin price is well over 1200 bucks, you know, that a hundred dollars could have been a million dollars. And it really starts making you question your life choices and going back to, you know, Hey, am I, am I, um, a low time preference individual or not? Because here I made a really, really bad choice for a very short term decision. And, um, you know, Bitcoin's ever stuck with me ever since then. Um, I tried buying my first miners back in 2013. I, I sent five grand off to Butterfly Labs and they never sent me my miners. I'm still waiting on those miners, Butterfly Labs, if you're listening. Um, 2014, I bought my first Bitcoins in an ATM. 2015, I started mining when Ether came out. So um, when Ether came out, I said, this is my chance to you know, get on the boat again. Um, it looks like a Bitcoin 2.0 all over again. I'm not gonna make the same mistakes I did in college. So. Um, I quit my job. I started mining Ether uh, full time. I, I built my first Bitcoin or my first Ether mine in Hong Kong, then in Taiwan, then in mainland China. In mainland China, it also became a Bitcoin mine. Um, and, you know, I, I operated there 
until um, end of 2017. Um, during 2017, with the Bitcoin price ripping, um, a lot of political pressure for a young white kid living in mainland China in his Bitcoin mine, skating around on his longboard. Um, you know, everybody knew I was there, <laughs> knew I was mining Bitcoin. And um, unfortunately, like for, for a young kid like me, it was, it was just too much to, to deal with all the, the political pressure. So I packed everything up, it turned out to be a really good time because it was, it was like October 2017. It was almost peak, peak market back then. Um, and I pivoted off into a, a hardware manufacturing business. So I started a business called Blue Tech. Uh, we did two-phase immersion cooling technology for Bitcoin miners, full containerized immersion mining specifically designed for flare gas. Um, a lot of things were really innovative at that time. You know, very few people were doing immersion. Almost nobody was doing two-phase. Um, we were doing full turnkey containerized setups, which nobody was offering at the time. And we were also doing financing because nobody could actually afford the equipment that we were trying to sell. So we had to arrange, you know, third party financing. So, you know, I believe I was the first person to offer minor financing. I believe I was the first person to build out containerized immersion mining equipment um, and, and, you know, sell it off to, to flare gas companies. Um, and that's really what attracted Bit Farms uh, to me. They saw what I was doing out there. I was I was operating in Alberta primarily, and uh, they wanted to you know expand outside of Quebec, start getting some greater diversification outside of the province. They saw what I was doing and and wanted to bring me on board. So, um, end of 2019, December 2019, um, I, I joined Bit Farms. So I, I've been with the company since COVID was a thing, and uh, I've been with them ever since. What a great story. Yeah, I've never heard that, Ben, especially the early, early years. And um, you and I, I guess, will get along. I did the exact same thing other than instead of leaves, I shoveled snow because I live in Canada. And I literally still have this entry safe in the uh, closet behind me here. But um, very cool story. I, too, had exposure to Bitcoin very early in university. We had 23 Bitcoin and we used it all on online poker buy-ins, uh, Ben. So I guess no better than spending it on beer. But uh, great story and hindsight is 2020, of course, for all of us. So now that we know who you are, we know how you got involved with BitFarms. I know you guys just came out with your earnings. You put up a loss, but there were definitely some great numbers within that earnings report. So we can we talk about some of the highlights and then we'll kick it over to Anthony. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that the real highlights here is that you know, our goals that we laid out at the beginning of, of last year, we accomplished, right? Like what we were really working on last year was strengthening our balance sheet, paying down our debt, improving our, our cash position and getting ourselves in a position for a lot of growth in 2024 um, when we anticipated the the cyclical having, you know, to, to repeat itself. So, you know, when we look at the, the nature of, of Bitcoin mining, you go back and you look at all the having epochs, it's something I talked about in, in our quarterly call, you know, every having epoch follows these similar trends. Um, one where, you know, Bitcoin price is rising far faster than the network cash rate can grow in the three to 18 months following a halving, resulting in really quickly improving hash price and mining margins. And that's where most miners make most of their money in a having epoch is those three to 18 months. So our goal last year was getting ready for that cycle. Um, and that's something that we did tremendously well. We, we paid down, you know, virtually all of our debt by the end of the year, it's zero now. Um, we, you know, built up our balance sheet. We secured a very large order for these new T21 miners, uh, which, you know, really are the most powerful Bitcoin miners out there, um, even more powerful than the, um, the S21 because they've got a, they're designed for a wider range of operating modes. Um, and we really were able to, you know, deliver on those goals we executed. And, and now we're, we're really on track and on budget for the growth cycle in 2024, you know, that we really wanted to execute on. I mean, I'd just like to emphasize, Ben, um, you know, I'm going back to mid-2022 and I, I put together an article out there and I actually included BitFarms in an article and it spoke about the, um, the issue of debt that some of the companies had taken on and yourselves, Argo, Blockchain and Greenwich Mining were the three companies I focused on, all because you had significant amounts of debt. 
Um, Argo obviously weren't able to turn that around as quickly as you guys did, and 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 they're sort of like you know still trying to sort of tread water a little bit, um, you know, with regards to you know that their facility that they used to have at um, at the Helios, which is now you know part of Galaxy's um, balance sheet, and also the fact they've just given away um, or sold one of their sites in uh, in in Canada as well uh, again to Galaxy. But you guys, um, you know, I think it was like I remember right about 160 million dollars of debt. Which you yeah. which you got rid of in, in effectively twenty months. So that's that's pretty amazing, really. During during a period where you know part of that period the Bitcoin price was still falling. Yes, we had a good run in twenty twenty three, which would have helped you from a from a sort of like a cash flow perspective, getting more money to pay off some of that debt. But you you did exactly what you said you did. You notified shareholders, I think mid- middle of last year, that you were going to get rid of the debt by February, and it was finished by February. So you know credibility for for doing that there. Um, in terms of um, what we've seen, some of the, the big managers release their earnings. We've had um, uh, we had uh, uh, Matt on from Clean Spark and Marathon release their earnings, and and also uh, Riot, and they've all made use of the of the FAS bill uh, FASB rule change in that um, they can now sort of like um, uh, value the Bitcoin on the balance sheet at, at, at the at the sort of like the current price, rather than the ability to. Um, only be able to value it when the price drops, which meant that you know their balance sheet from a crypto perspective was 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 significantly lower than probably the market price at the time. Is is that something the FSB rules something that affected Bit Farms? It's, it's one of the questions that came up from from a from from some of the shareholders. I thought I'd, I'd ask the question, but if you, I mean, from your perspective, are you using um, GAP or are you using IFRS? So we're uh, Canadian domiciled and we use IFRS. Uh, you know, right or wrong, IFRS is is different than GAP. Um, you know, we still recognize the value of our Bitcoin on our balance sheet as, as treasury. And, you know, we we look at that Bitcoin mark to market every single day. So we buy Bitcoin today. We earn that Bitcoin at 72,000. It's recorded at 72,000. You know, when we sell or or if we hold that Bitcoin, we don't sell it. You know, we'll recognize a gain or a loss at that time. So, um, you know, it affects things in a little different way, you know, but what that means is that our Bitcoin on balance sheet is not going into and is not kind of distorting the impact of, of the profitability of our operations or the cash flow that we get out of our operations. You know, it's just treated as a separate bucket. Um, it doesn't, you know, the FASB rules don't change anything in terms of the actual profitability of any company. It just changes how it's recorded um, and how it's recognized in accounting principles. But, you know, the same gain or loss applies whether you're with IFRS or whether you're with GAP, you know, you're still going to either gain on your Bitcoin or you're going to lose on your Bitcoin, depending on your entries and your exits. Yeah, and, and while while we were sort of on this podcast, I did I did have a quick sneak a sneak view at your um, at your balance sheet for the end of 2023, and it did reflect the, the sort of the true balance of Bitcoin price as at that date there. So that's confirmation there. Thanks, Ben. Um, another question that came up. From from shareholders and actually probably even for my own benefit as well is to understand more about what you're doing with regards to, you know, synthetic hodl. What what does that mean? And and could you explain, you know, to to, to people listening to this video, um, what Bit Farms are doing in that space? Yeah. So the synthetic hodl is a new program that we introduced last year. Um, really, this is this is part of how we're trying to manage our capital more efficiently. And, and uh, when we look at you know, how do we fund growth? Um, you know, there, there are only three basic options available to companies. You're either doing it out of cash flow from operations, you're doing it with debt, or you're doing it with equity. Um, you know, obviously, each one has its own pros and cons. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage that, that cost effectively. And with the synthetic HODL program, what we've been able to do is we've been able to maintain the upside of some of the Bitcoin that we sell to fund our growth, right? So, you know, you mine, let's say 10 Bitcoins in a day, you're spending, you know, maybe uh, six of them on, on operational expense. Maybe you're spending the remaining four on growth. Um, but what we can do now is we can say, well, let's spend three on growth and or three and a half on growth. And let's buy back some of that Bitcoin with half of the Bitcoin that we would have spent on growth. And we can maintain that upside through a long dated call over over the next year. Um, that program's worked out really well for us. It, it, it's not a very aggressive program. It's not a super meaningful part of our balance sheet. Uh, we have 135 long dated calls. Um, we bought those with, I think, strikes as low as 30K. And so, you know, we've done very well on that portfolio. Um, 
and and that's something that you know options are are volatile um, even more so than the Bitcoin price itself because it's based on you know probabilities of, of future expectations. Um, so we're up many hundreds of percent on that. Um, I don't want to pin that to a specific number because it, you know I don't want anybody to associate that. But we're up many many times on that um, initial investment there on the synthetic auto program, and it's proving that it's a quite a effective and and capital efficient way for us to to grow our hodl while also using the cash flow from operations to to fund our growth as much as possible. Hey Ben, I, I just want to jump in there. I know Anthony's got a few questions about how this is recorded and, and such, but uh, just to confirm because this was a specific subscriber question. So you've got staggered um, strike prices and staggered expiration dates, is that correct? But correct. all uh, 12 months or greater, like leaps essentially? Um, they, they vary, um, but but they're long dated calls. So I think the shortest we had was six months when we entered into it. Um, you know, usually we're trying to aim for the longest dated call option you can get, which is usually like 11 months. Um, the 12 month call options don't really exist because they come out, you know, right at the end of the month. And then, you know, the way that you calculate it ends up being 11 months. Um, so most of them are, are nine or 11 months. Um, and we have, I think, some as short as six months. And that's something you're continuing to buy and kind of cycle through, or is that a, a point in time and now these are just waiting to expire? So we manage that. We've got um, a head of risk management internally who, who runs our, our trading desk here at Bid Farms. And we also have a risk committee, you know, who's meeting every week on a weekly basis to talk about cash flow from operations, you know, CapEx requirements for our growth, what we're doing with our Bitcoin hodl, uh, where Bitcoin price is at right now. Do we want to, you know, increase the synthetic hodl? Do we want to sell our Bitcoin? We're, we're evaluating that on, you know, a daily and a weekly basis. Um, through through Jeff Gower, head of management there, and uh, through the risk committee, so it's something that we're you know we haven't pinned a specific um, we haven't pinned a specific target with our synthetic hodl. Um, really, it's another tool that we have in our our tool belt in order to try and get the most out of our cash flow from our operations. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I. I what I'll do is that there was a couple of more sort of like I'd say more accounting questions, but I I, I think um, to to get more out today, I'll I'll ask you Ben if you can get those questions answered internally and send us a bit of a response, and we can put that in the in the comments that that those 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 questions are answered. But um, I'll move on now to um, to the news that you you came out with uh, last Friday when you announced um, the three hundred and seventy five million uh, at the market offering. And this isn't new to mining companies, not, not even new to bit farms. I mean, you had ATM offerings before. Um, all the sort of like larger miners um, are using them because, you know, it gives the opportunity to, to, to grow. Um, and there was a little bit of, um, you know, frustration in the market. You know, certain shareholders on social media channels were sort of like coming out and saying, oh, an ATM, like, you know, and um, I, I think I understand the mining companies while they're doing it you know i mean d dilution is just one of those levers that you've got to pull um and you know in the, the debt lever is really something that most miners are staying staying clear from because of the 22 uh, 2022 yeah. experience so you know the opportunity to use atms we look at the likes of marathon look at the likes of riot look at the likes of clean spot who've used this um you know successfully in the last sort of 18 months and literally you know, effectively sold the company many times to get to where they are now, but it gets them to where they are now with with significant hash rate. Can you explain to to listeners from Bitfarm's perspective, you know, um, as to um, this amount three seventy five, what it's going to cover, and you know, we know that your your plan a little bit more came out yesterday with regards to the purchase of the machines. But, but how this 375 will effectively be be utilized um, over the, over the next you know the next year or so? Yeah, for sure. And um, you know, I, I think the first thing to start off with here is that you know there, there's a lot of misconceptions around ATM programs and, and how they work. You know, really, this is a quite cost effective source of capital. Um, it's quite cheap from a cost of capital perspective, and you know, it gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of when we're when we're raising capital and at what time and, and at what you know level of dilution. Uh, you know, for us, this is something that we think about really, really carefully, because when we look at growth, we're looking at a couple of different things. 
We're not just looking at, you know, the hardware price for that growth. We're looking at the marginal cost to grow the company, right? What does it actually cost us to grow that hash rate, you know, in total for infrastructure and assets and everything else? And then we're also looking at, well, you know, what's the cost of capital when we're when we're growing the company? And, you know, especially if we're looking at, uh, you know, diluting shareholders for, let's say, just just for growth sake, you know, that's something that we as a company would not do. Like, uh, we are only going to be, you know, exercising our ATM program for growth opportunities, pure growth opportunities. And at 375, that's out there is more than sufficient to cover our, our growth plans for this year to hit that 21 exahash target and buy all the miners and build out all the infrastructure. And it's not all going to happen, you know, all at once. Like these are multi-year programs. Um, and you always build in more than you would need in the shelf offering so that you have that flexibility in that future. So, you know, if you go back to our, our, our previous shelf offering, we didn't, use anywhere close to the full amount under the shelf offering, you know, over, I think the, the two year period that it was active, I think we use somewhere around 50, 60%, um, not a hundred percent on that number. I'm pulling it off of memory, but, uh, nowhere close to the, the full amount. So, um, the 375 is more than enough to get us on that 21 exa hash. And if you look at, you know, our growth plans for this year, our growth plans from 6.5 to 21 exa hash is, you know, over threefold growth in our total hash rate. And when you look at the improvements that we're going to get out of the efficiencies from this upgrade, we're going from 35 watts per terahash down to 21 watts per terahash. So that's a 40% improvement in efficiency in a 12 month period. There's not a single company who's out there who's talked about an efficiency improvement of 40%, not even close. And the reason why that is possible for us is because we were so disciplined last year and we were really, really, um, you know, hesitant to do something like, like grow with miners that, you know, we didn't think were cost effective and just grow for growth's sake. So because we held back last year, because we, we maintained our discipline and said, Hey, you know what? These XP miners don't actually fit our investment criteria. Um, the price is too high. The expected payback period is too far. Um, you know, we'd rather, and we're better off from a cash flow perspective and from, you know, a capital perspective, just not buying the XPs and continuing to run our, our fleet. And we'll wait for the next generation of miners to come out. Uh, you know, all of that's been enabled by what we did last year by strengthening the balance sheet, skipping the XP generation. And now when we're looking at executing on this ATM program this year, this becomes a really, really a creative opportunity. I mean, we're talking about more than a threefold growth in our hash rate and an almost cutting our energy efficiency in half, right? Or, or doubling our energy efficiency. So it's effectively like our own having um, that we're getting this year with that energy efficiency improvement of 40%. So we're promising the most like relative uh, growth in energy efficiency. And I think we have either the most or one of the most, um, uh, one of the highest relative growths in our hash rate promise for this year, you know, with an ATM program, that's a fraction of our market cap. Right. So the value that we're going to be getting out of this growth is, is really, really well justified by the cost of it. Um, you know, we're going to triple our company and, and, and almost cut our operating costs in half um, for a fraction of the company. Just just to tie into that, Ben. Um, so the, the 375 ATM offering obviously has is, 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 is had approval. Um, who determines when? and how the shares are effectively sold on the market. And bear in mind, we've had a bit of a pullback in the last week or so, um, even though the Bitcoin price has rallied um, in most of the shares, you, and, and yours yours too, obviously, um, I, I, you know, some of the impact from Friday's announcement, I think, was, was, was maybe part of the reason. But, but, but going forward now, over this period now, um, I'm assuming you have to meet minor payments at certain stages, but who determines, you know, um, at what price there's, at what price the shares are sold? Because if you're going to sell at two dollars forty, maybe the current price today, or 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 the price it was a few weeks ago, where it was like probably close to four dollars a share, um, that also impacts on the sort of like the level of dilution for the company as well in terms of, of you know in terms of value. Of course. So you know, obviously we've got you know payment obligations that we have with our growth plans for this year. Um, so that's a big determinant for uh, when we'd be exercising under this program. Um, you know, and then the other things are market considerations. So those are done on a, on a day to day and a week to big basis where we're evaluating, Hey, how much capital do we need to have, you know, to meet our obligations? 
this month, next month, over the next three months, is now a good time or, or should we wait for, for maybe better time in the, in the short term? Um, that's something that's being decided by, by a group of people, you know, much more sophisticated than myself with that sort of analysis. Um, and it, and it involves both the bankers and also our finance team um, to try and, and minimize the, the impact from these programs um, while also raising the most amount of cash for our, for our growth. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Always good to, to sell into strength with those programs. Um, now, I know you've talked about the ATM as, as a means to kind of finance some of those minor purchases and aggressive growth, it sounds like, in 2024. Um, I also wanted to throw in, you guys have very competitive energy rates locked in as well, so things are looking quite nice on that front as well. Yep. Uh, we talked about the synthetic coddle to lock in some of that upside uh, potential of Bitcoin itself. What are your thoughts on actual traditional Bitcoin HODL this year? Um, are you going to be trying to, to accumulate as much as you can, uh, thinking that that bullish cycle is coming? Are you going to focus more on the synthetic HODL? Um, where do we think about that? So, you know, right now we're selling pretty much everything we mine for growth. Um, the growth plans right now are our are, are primary focus. Um, you know, as Bitcoin price improves, we're going to constantly reevaluate that. And as we, um, you know, deliver these these hash rate improvements and these efficiency improvements, we're also going to see better and better margins. And so as those margins widen over the course of the year with our deployment plan, you know, that's something that we're going to have a lot more flexibility with. You know, the growth will be as we go through, the growth will be past us. The capital obligations will be less. The margins will be widening and we'll have a little bit more strategic flexibility uh, with what we do with our growing our HODL. Uh, you know, what we think though, is that the synthetic HODL program that we've put in place might be a more efficient means of, of building our HODL than just um, converting or, or just keeping some of the Bitcoins that we mined. And so I think what you should, you know, expect from us this year is, is, you know, to take a very, you know, analytical approach, primarily focused on growth, but also trying to be capital efficient, right? So, you know, we may be looking to increase our synthetic model this year. Um, this is something that's really going to be market dependent, though. Um, you know, and, and like all of our decisions as a company, uh, we are largely dependent on what's happening with the Bitcoin price because, you know, there are going to be certain times where the, the premiums on the synthetic model might be too juicy to justify, right? And we're better off with just going straight HODL. But there's going to be other times where those premiums are, are pretty cheap and it's going to be a lot better for us to, to grow the synthetic model. So, that's something that you know we are going to keep a close eye on. Um, we haven't provided any guidance on that, and I, I wouldn't expect us to provide any guidance on you know a specific number for for our HODL targets. Um, but you know we are Bitcoin miners because we believe in Bitcoin, and you know we're not here because we think Bitcoin's going to zero. We we're here because we're building the future of this this infrastructure, and we want to capitalize on these rising Bitcoin prices. Um, so you know. Improving our mining margins is one way to do that, but also increasing our HODL and increasing our synthetic HODL are two other ways that we'll look to do that as well, you know, assuming market conditions are right. Perfect. And Anthony, I think we did a fairly good job of answering the next one. So you can take us down to South yeah. America now, Anthony. Yeah. So obviously, um, you know, so, you know, the last 18 months about the, the, the sites that you um, got going is in Argentina and in Paraguay. Um, and people obviously will always question when miners, you know, go outside of North America for any reason. But, um, you know, can you give us sort of like an understanding of, of, of how you see the political state of play in South America? And sort of alongside that, if things change, because we know in, in countries things can change very quickly. What what sort of, you know, um, plan do sort of do bit, bit farms have if things need to happen um, at speed? Yeah, so you know we have pursued um, international diversification outside of outside of Quebec and the United States. I think it's a pretty you know unique feature uh, for bid farms. There's not a whole lot of companies who have a very uh, diversified portfolio internationally. Um, and the reason why we're we're really excited about Latin America is because it has a great potential to reduce our average electricity prices. So as a company, you know, our key driver for maintaining our costs over the long term is not energy efficiency of the miners, which is subject to, you know, a constant improvement cycle. It's actually driving down our average price of electricity, which has a much more meaningful impact on our, you know, our hash cost and our direct cost to produce a Bitcoin. 
And what we see in Argentina, for instance, like we've got 2.1 cents power right there with no curtailment, you know, show me a 2.1 cent power rate in the United States with no curtailment, you know, like they're almost non-existent. And so in order for us to constantly work on not only just spreading our, spreading our eggs around to more baskets, but also driving down that lower cost of power, Latin America is proving to be a really, really promising area for us. And so, you know, we dipped our toes in the water with our first Paraguay site uh, about two years ago, 10 megawatts, fairly small. Uh, we sent in used equipment to further minimize the risk and the initial CapEx. Um, but, you know, we had a tremendous success there. We built that farm in three months at a fraction of the price of any farm that we've ever built, you know, in, in the United States or Canada. And, you know, we were able to, to do so with good visibility, you know, clear communication, you know, good execution on time, on track and on budget. And, you know, after some period of time, we upgraded that with, with newer miners. And, you know, now we're looking at how do we, how do we get our growth? Well, you know, very few areas represent areas where we can bring down our average cost of power because our average cost of power is, is already quite competitive at, at around four cents. Um, in order to do that, you basically have to incur some other cost. Um, for most of the opportunities in the United States, that would in, mean you know some amount of curtailment and you're trading uptime in order to bring down your average price of power. Now that's a very effective business model for, for many, many companies. Uh, but it, what it means is that, you know, maybe you are down 10% of the time, or maybe you're down 20% of the time, or 30, or 40, or 50, or maybe it's only 2%. You really don't know and you don't have, you know, that visibility and that control over your operations because you're subject to those market whims. As we're looking at the 2024 growth cycle um, and, and how the halving cycles generally play out, you know, we want to have that low cost of energy. We want to continue bringing our average price of power down. But we don't necessarily want to sacrifice a bunch of uptime in what we think might be the most promising bull market uh, that we've ever seen. So, you know, for us, Paraguay and Latin America represent this fantastic opportunity for us to bring down our average cost of power without sacrificing the uptime so that we get the best utilization out of our assets during what we expect to be, you know, one of the most exciting bull runs uh, that we've ever seen in the Bitcoin mining space. And you know, there's a lot of things that 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 feed into that because um, you look at this at this having cycle. You know, there's only uh, four having epochs so far, and this having epoch has three features we've never seen before. One, you have the China mining ban, which put that artificial limitation on growth, and it's still holding back the network. Right? I mean, China's the number one electricity producer and consumer in the world by a large margin. It doesn't even come close to second place. And you know, you just pulled all of that off for you know Bitcoin miners. And traditionally, it was 65, 70 percent of the industry. So if the China mining ban didn't take place, it is it is you know a guaranteed fact that the Bitcoin mining network would be bigger today, and mining economics would be worse today than had it not happened. Right? Number one. Number two, we have never, ever, ever set an all-time high leading into a halving. And this is this is completely unprecedented. It has to do with the impact of ETFs and all of this institutional adoption, which really it's unclear how big this can be and how much of an effect that this can have. But you know, we are looking at you know ETFs and institutional adoption, new all-time highs, and you know this this limitation on the growth, um, which which puts us in a really really strong place going into this having. We've never mining economics have actually never been this strong heading into a halving, if you look back historically, they, they've just never been this good. Um, so we want to maximize that uptime for this year. Um, but we, we also don't want to increase our cost of power. So we do have that long term view on energy. And we think LADAM is a great way for us to do that. Um, and we want to get the most out of this, this next bull market, which which we're going to be able to do in LADAM. So just Paraguay is on track, it's on budget. Um, you know, we've got our first miners turning online in the next couple of weeks, um, which is very exciting at our new Paso Pay facility, um, you know, and we've got uh, 170 megawatts worth of infrastructure and deployment that we're planning on this year in, in Paraguay alone. So, you know, when you look at where our growth is going to come from this year, it's going to come from two buckets. One, you've got the fleet upgrade program. We'll pull about 68% of our miners are going to go to replace existing miners in existing facilities. 
primarily it's a plug and play upgrade with, you know, Quebec, Washington, and, and everywhere else where we're just swapping out PDUs. There are very few exceptions to that rule. Um, in Paraguay, that's going to be the lion's share of most of our new construction and our new growth. So the incremental hash rate from Paraguay is quite meaningful. Um, and, you know, it's, it's our only, it's our only jurisdiction where the long-term view on power prices is, is actually down. Um, you know, we've got a 3.9 cent flat contract before VAT, uh, but it's not subject to any sort of annual inflation. And so as inflation continues to, uh, you know, take place, like this is a contract which continuously gets cheaper and cheaper over time, um, you know, in terms of the, the effectiveness of that, that dollar purchasing power, right? So we're really excited about Paraguay. Uh, we're really excited about the growth there. You know, this is a country that in a, in a market that ticks the same boxes that we have in all of our other markets. One of massive electricity generation oversupply relative to demand with very little drivers to drive that price up, right? So that's something that we have in Quebec. That's something that we have in Washington, central Washington area where there's 11 and a half gigawatts of hydropower installed within an hour and a half radius of our site there, 11 and a half gigawatts. Um, it's something they have in Paraguay where I think they're producing somewhere around 14 gigawatts there and it's like 65 percent of it is exported out of the country because for, for a lower price than what we're paying for it because there's just no demand internally right so those long-term drivers for us hey where are we going to get good cost of power where can we build cost effectively where can we deploy in areas where we've got long-term visibility on power prices and they're not going to increase our costs over long term Paraguay is a very good option for us. And um, Argentina has been as well. I mean, it's, it's our lowest cost operating site right now, 2.1 cents. It, it sounds, Ben, like you, you're sort of answering, I was going to add a little add-on question about, you know, are you, as a company, still monitoring not just the locations that are in the moment, but other locations further further afield, uh, like some of the other miners are looking at the moment. We've, we've seen miners going to the UAE. We've seen them uh, now start to move into Africa. Um, but I mean, I think you you hinted on the fact that you know where there's cheap power, it's gonna you know it's gonna be a cost associated with getting to that cheap power. So I'm assuming for this year, focus on what you're doing to get to your 21 extra hash and, and maybe something that you pick up for 2025. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, you know, we always have our our eyes open for for new opportunities and cost effective opportunities to grow and improve our average price of power. Um, you know, whether you're in the United States or anywhere else, there's a cost to reducing your price of power. There always is. Um, you know, when we look at, when we look at different regions, we think there's a lot of regions where there's good potential. Um, you know, there's a lot of old infrastructure that's kind of being decommissioned and coming offline. Um, and when you look at, especially things like aluminum smelters around the world, which have proven to be a great, you know, asset for Bitcoin miners in the United States, you know, there's plenty of these opportunities around the world. Um, I think we've got a great, you know, position as a company with this international experience that we already have. I mean, we operate as a country, as a company in three different languages in four countries. We've got 11 different sites with, I think, seven different electricity providers. Um, it's going to be eight electricity providers and 13 sites at the end of this, at the end of this year. You know, when you look at our assets like a portfolio and we're managing them like a portfolio, what we want is to be constantly rebalancing our portfolio so that you know we're getting what we believe is you know a, a better blend of energy prices energy efficiencies you know good miners um and, and good hash cost and, and i think that's largely what we're accomplishing this year um if you look at and we have a slide in our quarterly reporting for our performa portfolio at the end of the the year when the upgrade is done and you'll see that you know by the end of this year no single country is going to contribute more than 50 percent of our revenues um, you know, we're going to have a, a good mix of, of miners with no miners operating over, over 30 watts per tera hash. Um, most of our miners are going to be operating at 22 or below. And we've got a, a good variety of power costs that range kind of anywhere between two and, and the mid fours, um, which, which gives us a lot of flexibility. And it also gives us, you know, a lot of confidence in terms of our ability to continue to operate profitably and sustainably into the future. That, that, that's 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 good to hear. Um, switching now away from sort of Bitcoin mining, and if you think about the last sort of three or four months, and and, and with the exception of of, of Hive Digital and Hot, who were 
sort of like more focusing their way towards um, high performance computing with the amounts of GPUs that they had on their on their balance sheet from their Ethereum mining days. We're seeing now an influx of um, of Bitcoin miners um, moving into this space. We've had Sam Tabor on the podcast twice in the last few months to articulate what they're doing and what started as a I think it was a 35 million year uh, annualized contract over the next three years to deliver high performance computing for an AI provider. Um, that went to 50 million in very short term. And now he's talk, talking about that's going to go to 100 million by the end of 2024. And the margins, um, well, we've heard, we've heard from two other mining companies what, what the potential margins are in this space. Is this, is this an area that bit farms are, are just keeping a watchful eye over or, or, or an interest in? Or are you going to stay down the route? Um, I was going to say stay down the route as like, sort of like the bigger miners, but then Core Scientific just announced they're looking at this space and have, have, have highlighted a, an update um, literally um, you know, this, this week or the end of last week about, um, about a contract they, they've got in place. But from bit, bit farms' point of view, where are you positioned in this market? Yeah, you know, this it's a great question. Lots of people are looking at HPC and AI right now. You know, really, when you look at these two businesses, um, the only similarity that they have is they both consume large amounts of power. Um, there's not a whole lot of other similarities. You know, the the kind of requirements that you want for an HPC and AI data center is actually not low cost power. It's actually highly reliable power. Um, so, you know, you want dual redundancy on your substation or you want backup generators because, you know, Bitcoin mining is the only data center in the world that's designed to be anti-fragile. And, you know, if for whatever reason power goes out or is not available, you know, like you just turn off and it's fine. Um, you know, that's not possible for an AWS or a Twitter or, you know, a Google, you know, if, if God forbid, if you couldn't post your photo of your breakfast this morning, you know, because... Uh, Instagram servers went down, people would lose their mind, right? So instead, they'll have diesel generators, you know, standing on standby and maybe dual redundancy at the substation. And so the kind of infrastructure actually that's best for Bitcoin mining is not also, it's not really the best infrastructure for HPC and AI. And, you know, when we look at what we do well as a company, we do really well at building Bitcoin mining infrastructure. We're really good at building and operating what we believe to be some of the best Bitcoin mining infrastructure in the world. And it's just not analogous to HPC and AI. You know, the the, the cost to build out uh, HPC and AI is in the millions of dollars a megawatt. The cost to build out Bitcoin mining is in the hundreds of thousands per megawatt. Um, the kind of infrastructure, the kind of technologies, the kind of staff, the kind of software, there's not a single thing which is the same across both different business lines. Um, we really are, are not very aggressive into the HPC and the AI space. We've looked at it, um, we've explored it, um, but you know we think that the market really prefers pure plays, um, and and that's what we are, and that's what we've always been. You know, when you look at what are the the pubcos with the most volume and the most interest in their stock tickers and you know, kind of the the most active you know groups they're the pure place. They're, they're not the groups who are diversifying, you know, leading into what could be the most promising bull market we've ever seen. Um, and, you know, mitigating that, that the impact of that, that bull market, the market seems to really, really prefer the pure place. And especially when you now have, uh, you know, the ETFs out there and people are, are even questioning, Hey, with ETFs out there, does it make sense for a Bitcoin miner to even hold on to their Bitcoin? Because, you know, as an investor, if you want that Bitcoin, you know, just that Bitcoin HODL exposure, you could manage that in your own portfolio by buying into an ETF. And then you can manage the Bitcoin miners by buying a Bitcoin miner. In the same way, if you want that HPC and AI exposure, shouldn't you just also buy an HPC and AI company as opposed to having one company doing both things? Maybe not necessarily better. Right. Um, so we don't really think the synergies are there. And we think that the market really prefers that pure play, um, which is which is where we're going to be. You know, we've always been miners. We will always be miners. Um, and there's a reason for that it's because it's what we do really well. And that's where we think the most opportunity is for us to get a good return on our invested capital. Yeah, I love what I'm hearing here, Ben, and, and it's so interesting. We talk with a lot of uh, C-suite members of mining companies and the differences we're now starting to see in the HODL strategy 
and in the HPC strategy is really is really interesting and unique. I do agree with you though, people have an appetite for peer play miners. And that kind of brings us to our last question here. So you just alluded to that there's a general sense of, of more options, I guess, out there now. People have a larger menu to choose from. We're starting to see some money flow from the miners, <clears throat> which were previously a great source of exposure to Bitcoin, into the ETFs, into micro strategy. So the final question for you, and I think you've already done a pretty good job hearing the mining economics are, are some of the best you've seen. The bull cycle setting up to be one of the best you've seen. In your opinion, why should people buy shares of bit farms as opposed to other miners, ETFs, spot Bitcoin, uh, or maybe any other means of um, exposure to this asset? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and probably the most important one of, of the whole morning here. Um, you know, I, I think when you're looking at how do you get exposure to Bitcoin is is really what most people are, are looking at, right? And, you know, now you've got more options than you had, you know, even just a few months ago with, with the introduction of BTS. Um, you know, I think there's no secret that the understanding of our industry and kind of the economic literacy of, of the Bitcoin mining industry is pretty low. Um, there's not a whole lot of, of good information out there. There's probably far more misunderstanding and misconceptions about what we do and how we operate and, and kind of what our business models look like um, than there is, you know, good and accurate information or, or understanding of, of what we do. And so, you know, this, this you know, divergence that we've seen with, with Bitcoin price and ETFs, you know, I think is probably a short-lived one. I think this is the market saying, you know, we really do not understand the halving. We have no idea what's going to happen. There certainly have been quite a few CEOs who have been, you know, saying everybody's going to go bankrupt and, and everybody is going to fail, you know, other than us. And, you know, that could put even more fear into the market. Um, you know, the reality is, is that, like I said, the mining economics going into this halving cycle have never, ever been better, better ever. Um, this is the strongest we've ever been going into a uh, having epoch. And we've now have this, this foundation here with the institutions that really is, is the next slave forward. You know, when you look at, um, each having epoch kind of as a, a maturity cycle, you go from the first one where it's like hobbyist miners. The second one is like your, your first entrepreneurs. Um, the third one, you start having kind of you know, larger companies starting to form and trying to build scale. Um, this last one has been about kind of the corporatization um, of, of these of these miners. I think the next stage is, is really the institutional adoption. And so I think what we're seeing right now is, a, is that divergence because the market just doesn't understand the Bitcoin mining space, who we are. I think there's a lot of fear and they're trying to de-risk that event. So if you rotate out of a Bitcoin miner and into an ETF, you're able to say, hey, well, you know, if the Bitcoin price goes up because of the halving, we benefit from the ETF and we de-risk the halving. You know, that would explain Bitcoin price going up while having while minor prices going down. Um, but if you're a long term, you know, if you have a long term view on Bitcoin mining, you understand how these cycles take place. Like this could be your best buying opportunity because the you know, like I did a historical analysis for every single minor purchase that we've that we've done uh, as a company going back to the date that we bought it, the price that we paid, um, how much they, they've actually generated in revenue, how much they've cost us, what have been the paybacks. And what we found is that, you know, more so than any other variable, the, the price of the hardware, the, the model, the manufacturer of the hardware, the timing of the purchase relative to the cycle was the single most important decision and factor that we had when it came to allocating capital. And so, you know, the the miners that we're, we're unplugging now, the first miners that are going to be upgraded uh, in our T21 plan are M31S miners. We bought these back in 2020. Some of these miners have paid for themselves eight times over, right? And they're still adding to our free cash flow today. Like these are these are four-year-old miners that have paid for themselves eight times over and are still adding free cash flow. Like that is a very, very, you know, unique opportunity. And it's, and it's only really present at times like this, where the prices are low, and you know we're just about heading off into that cycle. So, you know, if you're a long-term view, I think the Bitcoin miners pre present a really, really good and interesting opportunity. And you know, certainly at levels that are seemingly cheaper uh, today than they were, you know, just just even a few weeks ago. I mean, if you go back to 
uh, Valentine's Day, um, there's not a single miner that is up since Valentine's Day. So clearly the market has no love for Bitcoin miners right now. Um, we're, we're all down relative to Bitcoin in that same period. But I think this is a short term, short term divergence. Um, now, you know, what you've got to say is, OK, well, of the different Bitcoin mining um, companies that are out there, you know, who do I want to get my exposure with? And, you know, there's I don't think any company out there that has the kind of track record that we do, you know, seven years operating um, international diversification the big four auditors in terms of, of providing the strength and the, the reputation in terms of the, the numbers and the trustworthiness of the, of the numbers. But most importantly, threefold growth and a 40% improvement in energy efficiency. This is the most meaningful growth that the industry will see amongst any public company this year. And so, you know, if you're looking for where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, I think you're going to get it in bit farms because we had that discipline last year. To not, to not be aggressive in our growth. We obviously, I think, got oversold as a result of that. You know, the market really values growth, um, sometimes to its own detriment. Um, you know, but what we're promising this year is, I think, the most, the largest improvement in growth and the largest relative improvement in energy efficiency of any miner at the right time in the halving cycle going into what we think is the best Bitcoin mining bull cycle that we might have ever experienced. So, you know, should you be buying Bitcoin miners right now? I, I think you're long-term bull. Absolutely, yes. These are probably good buying opportunities. And I think Bit Farms is probably the best buying opportunity out there. Well, if you needed a it's shot of confidence. We had, we, had a, we had a poll about um, uh, a couple of weeks ago and got people to announce their top three picks. And I've done this over, th over the last three years. And in every year, Bit Farms is the only company to appear in the top three. Um, so irrespective of what happens, different miners have appeared in the, in the first year and then it's moved. And, and, and in, in, in the current year now, the top three, in no particular order, were, were, were Bit Farms, Iris Energy and Clean Spark. Um, so that, sure. tells you, that tells you from a retail investor where they see their money, not what we're saying on this channel, but um, that's where the retail investors respond to that. And I had in excess of 500 responses. So it's not, it wasn't a, a small sample. Um, I mean, and but yeah. we, we've got a tremendous following, you know, w with our retail. And, and if you look at our volume, you know, especially since we announced our, our transformative fleet upgrade program in November, our volume has just done just done tremendously. Um, you know, we've increased multiple times our, our volume and our volume is competitive with, you know, the, the much bigger uh, market caps out there. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest in our stock. I think there's a lot of activity in our stock and, you know, we have been around for a very, very long time. Um, you know, we're consistently a competitor. We're consistently there at the top. And I think this year we've really set ourselves up for the most meaningful growth we've ever seen. Um, so, I, you know, we're very bullish here at BitFarms. I was going to say, if you need a shot of confidence this morning, there it is for you guys, especially <laughs> for your BitFarms holders. Um, as always, you guys, not financial advice, but a very strong case laid out by Ben. Uh, we've filled up the whole hour, you guys. Great discussion. I took a lot away from this one. Ben, I've been wanting to meet you for uh, years now, and it, it's a, been a real pleasure. I'll kick it back to you for any closing thoughts. Anthony, if you have anything else to throw in there, and then I can do my wrap-up. Just just one one closing quick thought, and and, and, and you highlighted something on the lines in your, in your last discussion there. We've noticed um, two at least two more potential new supplies coming to the market this year. So Bitdeer have just announced that they've successfully tested their machines, which are coming in just slightly less efficient, maybe eight, I think it's 18 and a half when you compare that to the, to the S21. And obviously Auradyne are, are, are doing things in their space uh, in Palo Alto or whatever to, to, to deliver machines to the market as well. Do you see that as a, as a good thing for miners with having that, you know, more supplies to the market, therefore, Maybe, you know, rather than having just three supplies, you've got, you know, competitive advantage then to sort of like keep prices where they are. Or do you think um, the three big three big names, which we, we normally associate with Bitcoin miners, are still going to be, you know, strong, strong in the space? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. The mining space is, is cutthroat and um, the hardware space even more so than the actual mining of the with the hardware. Um, you know, every single bull market, you are going to see new companies kind of come in here and, and trying to disrupt the space. Um, very few have succeeded historically. Um, you know, so we see a lot more companies who, who come in and, and just kind of, you know, never really materialize too much. Um, you know, obviously, 
the industry now is a lot more mature than it was over the last couple of years. So hopefully there is, you know, space for new miners to come in or new miner manufacturers to come in, um, create new products, create better solutions, and, you know, hopefully be, be competitive on pricing. But, you know, I would say that like our T21 miners that we have right now are absolutely crushing it in all of our, our initial performance tests. Um, they're outperforming across every single spec. And when you look back historically in terms of kind of the T series performance versus the S series performance, what you find is that, uh, and this is something that only, you know, like more experienced miners may have this, this insight to, um, but the T series generally has a lot more unlockable power um, built into that product line and it's not priced in. So you get a lot more bang for your buck on these T21s. And, and with the price that we've been paying, you know, on these T21s at $14 a terahash, I just don't know how anyone else can compete. Um, it's it, it's such an attractive price for such attractive performance. Like, I, it, it would be it would be a violation of my fiduciary responsibility to buy a miner from another manufacturer when I can get the miners that we just bought from Bitmain at the price that we just bought them for, right? So um, I think you know I'm, I'm hopeful we see more competition in this space. Um, but Bitmain really, really has a, a strong hold on the market, and, and I, you shouldn't expect that to go away anytime soon. Um, you know, I think MicroVT is carving out a good name for themselves in um, in the space as well, and I think really their hydro technology is, is really, really powerful. We're deploying our first MicroVT hydro miners um, in Paraguay right now. We've got more miners coming to um, to, to Quebec. And you know, I think they're going to really do well in that in that hydro mining space because the hydro mining space requires a lot more um, high-grade precision in the engineering in order to develop a, a very, very good product. And I think that's really where micro VT excels. So, um, you know, let, let's see what happens. Um, but right now, we are so happy with our, our T21 miners. And um, it, you will not see us buying anything, um, you know, from, from another competitor, I think, this year. Sounds promising, Ben. Thank you. There you have it. The T21s are crushing it. Ben, you crushed it today as well. I'll give it back to you for any closing thoughts, and then we can wrap this one up. Yeah, I mean, closing thoughts. Um, I think we covered a lot today. Uh, the the big thing here is, you know, again, we, we've never had we've never had a more bullish setup than we have right now. Um, the lower prices go in miners, you know, in in this kind of divergence. I think the better opportunities that investors have to, to get in on the space. So um, we'll, we'll see what 2024 brings, but I'm incredibly bullish for 2024. Uh, I haven't been this bullish since probably 2017. Um, I think this feels a lot more like 26, 2017 than it does feel like 2020, 2021. Um, and, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, the market in 2017 was, was incredibly robust. And um, we saw a tremendous outperformance in price relative to the way that hash rate can grow. Um, and we look around the world at, at, you know, how long it's taking people to actually build up new energy infrastructure. I think we're going to see that same dynamic take place where, you know, Bitcoin price rips. We're not going to be able to build energy infrastructure to plug in all these new miners fast enough to capture or, or, or you know, mitigate that rise in Bitcoin price. So you're just going to get quickly expanding mining margins that constantly reduce the average payback time for miners. So, um, you know, you take that historical cycle, um, you know, to your advantage, take that, you know, historical analysis of the every miner purchase that we've ever done and, and the timing importance uh, of those mining purchases to your advantage um, and start looking up at the public miners. That works for me. There you have it, folks. Would you rather, I saw a tweet, would you rather keep paying higher and higher prices for Bitcoin or lower and lower prices for Bitcoin miners? And it seems to be a, a fairly logical decision at this point. Ben, thanks so much for your time. Anthony, always a pleasure. Uh, if you guys are still watching, hit the like button. It helps get this content to other people who may find value. If you're not subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join. Ben, are you subscribed to the channel? I think I am. All right. Make sure you do if <laughs> you're not go. already. <laughs> And if we didn't uh, get any of your questions answered, which I hope we didn't because we, we covered a lot of ground there, but if there were any, leave them in the comment section. We'll make sure to pass them over. And Ben, we'll send you some of the more detailed ones on the synthetic hodl as well. Yeah. Thanks so much, you guys. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Great to be on.